Um, and then finally, last but not least, Jean Hammond, who you heard a little bit about, is director of the Stony Brook Write Program in Writing and Rhetoric, author of an excellent text on writing called Thoughtful Writing, and has taught not only his it leads a program that does a lot of targeted writing, um, working with various science departments at Stony Brook. Those writing courses tend to be professionally oriented, you know, writing of grants and presentations and papers. But Jean has also been working with us to do writing for the public, writing about science for a more general audience, and is helping us develop that whole program. And he's done similar kinds of workshops for other kinds of professional groups, such as judges who also want to write for the public. So I'm going to, Jean is going to, I'm going to turn it over to Jean. We are running a little late, but as we said, and just explain, it will be lunch, and then we'll right, come back here. Right, it will be lunch, then we'll come back here, and Alan will do a little more introduction about improv, and then we'll break into the three groups. Um, there are one, two rooms here and one room in a neighboring building, and there'll be people here to show you to the rooms when we divide up. And then that's the rest of the afternoon. And when improv ends, we come back for dinner. there's dinner out in the lobby. And then the um, presentation by Casey and by um, Greg Kreitzer, who is, some of you may know, um, another very um, distinguished science writer. He's written a number of popular books, the most recent, or best known, I would say, being Fatland, which the subtitle, I think, is how Americans ended up as the fattest people in the world. <laughs> um, so um, Greg's not here right now, but he will be here for the evening. OK, so Gene. Are you sure, Gene, if you want this? I'll try this. I won't be doing my speaking. I'm going to put you to work. <laughs> First of all, it's really wonderful to be here at UCLA because I taught it for 22 years at the University of Maryland. And from the day I arrived, we were aspiring to be the UCLA of the East. <laughs> um, and I think we've gotten a whole lot better over the 30 years uh, since I started. But I think you've gotten a whole lot better, too, so I'm not sure we've still made it. Uh, second thing I wanted to say is, is that we've divided up very unfairly, I think, the teaching responsibilities here. Alan Alda did the inspiring part. And I'm going to give you the homework. Okay. <laughs> And one of the many research, um, controversial research issues in the last 10 years has been whether homework is valuable or not, right? Uh, there, there's a whole range of things that went out 10, 12 years ago, maybe around that time, that indicated that homework is useless, right? So then everybody, of course, who wished that that was true, uh, especially the students, but some of the parents too, uh, latched onto that research. Anyway, I don't believe it. Um, and as was said this morning, the, the, the way that you improve at something is to practice at it, right? And to practice in an informed way. I, I was a basketball coach for 15 years, which I had a great time doing. And people used to say, it's, it's not just practice, practice, practice. It's perfect practice makes perfect. <laughs> not practice makes perfect. So I want you to do some writing. You're going to do some writing between today and tomorrow. In fact, before we let you out of this room. Not a whole lot, but hopefully well considered. Uh, and then again tomorrow, when we have our workshop, I'll have you do some more writing that then we will go over on, on, on Friday. Um, okay. I, I just want to tell you about my own experience uh, briefly. When I was in graduate school uh, at Yale, nearing, nearing, nearing the finishing of my PhD, I got a paper back from a professor that said, give me a C, and then said, very painful reading. <laughs> It's probably the lowest point of my academic uh, life, <laughs> especially since I thought I was going to go into teaching writing. And um, I, I went through about a week or two of soul searching and then ab about a year or two of reading about writing and trying to learn as much as I could about it. I think up until that time I had, I had relied on my intuition to get by. And uh, the book that actually helped me the most is by a guy named William Zinzer. You may have heard of it called On Writing Well, uh, still in print in about its uh, sixth edition or something like that by now. But I, I recommend that book to you. It, it's, it, it's a good, clear, uh, inspiring book about uh, getting yourself to think about writing. And everybody, everybody needs to do it. If you go back to the 19th century, and of course, for many centuries before that, uh, almost all the way back, in fact, beyond the point where they were throwing children in the river, uh, rhetoric was the center of the, of the collegiate curriculum. Everybody learned rhetoric, which was how to present your ideas. And they didn't even spend that much time on content. 
And now we've gone to the opposite extreme where we spend so much time on content that we've ignored the rhetoric. So we're trying to, through this Center for Communicating Science, to get that rhetoric back into some kind of central position in, in the university and in people's thoughts. Okay. Um, I think that learning to write well is not difficult. It really is not difficult. It's, it's so much easier than almost every other skill that you will ever learn. You only have to learn a few things. What is difficult about learning to write is learning to unlearn all your bad habits, okay? It's, it's, it'll be the same, I think, with improv. Improv is not that difficult, but it's, it's all the bad habits that resist, that, you, that your body resists, that your mind resists, uh, getting over in order to just write well. So since I have only a couple minutes this morning, I'm gonna ignore the problematic parts. We'll talk about those tomorrow. But I'll just say, what, what do you need to do in order to write well, quickly? First of all, you need telling details, okay? Uh, we talk about it as evidence, right? But not just any old evidence, and I think this is one reason why a lot of scientific writing is not that interesting to read. You wanna have the details selected that make a difference, okay? That if people pay attention to and think about, uh, they, that they will actually learn something. And I think the most complicated and difficult skill of writing is learning to decide what details are telling, okay? And if the details that you select are telling, then that will carry your message forward. Second thing that you need to do, of course, is to draw good inferences from, from the details that you select. That's where all our scientific training comes in or all our academic training of any kind and all our experience, okay? When we draw inferences, we draw them very differently based on the same facts. It's because we have different experience that we bring to bear. Maybe we come from a different country. Certainly we come from different family backgrounds. Certainly different emphases have been in our lives. And all those things lead us to interpret matter differently. So if you're co-writing a paper with three or four other people, you all have the same evidence in front of you, you will all most likely have different ideas about you know, how to present that or what, what, excuse me, what conclusions to draw. Uh, I think you and then your students in turn, if you want to be good communicators, have to think about how do I draw inferences and what kind of inferences am I drawing? Are they too bold? Are they too timid? You know, uh, do I have enough evidence uh, to justify a bold inference? And if it's too timid, then nobody's gonna publish it. Okay, next thing that you need to do is, is what Alan illustrated extremely well today. And this is one of the hardest things about writing is to get the reader into some spot in your brain, okay? I think some of you that are neurobiologists someday will tell us where that spot is, okay? But much of writing is intuition. And most of our students, students, you know, if you're teaching undergraduates at any level, they don't have too much sense when they're writing anything that it's going to anybody, okay? And, and as Alan described this morning when, when trying to write, if you write a sentence and you stop and think, who is this going to? Will it make sense to them? And then you get that feedback loop going in your brain. And then you write the next sentence and you still say, will that make sense to that person? And bring it back again. After a while, you don't have to think about it. It, just, it becomes automatic. But it's very important to plant that little spot in the brain where you're not just spouting what you know, but you are thinking about who you are writing to. And there's been a lot of bad advice that's been given about that. And I think a lot of the bad advice is based on audience. You know, pick your audience. Know your audience. That, that's a marketing technique. You know, they decide 25-year-olds buy such and such and such and such. And so then they, I, I would say, almost consistently underestimate their audiences, right? Whereas if you think about a reader, any individual reader you have respect for, say all professors. If you think all professors, you'll probably make fun of them in some way, right? Some of you did this morning, <laughs> okay? But if you think of individual professors, you have tremendous respect for them. And when you're writing, I think it's very important not to think of an audience of the general public, but to think of specific people, your parents, your grandparents, um, friends, or, or whatever. Sometimes you have to do a little adjusting, you know, because your parents aren't exactly the audience for your work. But um, thinking of individual readers rather than audiences, I think a huge, hugely important thing to do. Uh, next, ethos, logos, and pathos. I'm speaking Greek there for a second. Uh, Aristotle is one of my favorite writers, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, Aristotle gave us those terms, ethos, logos, and pathos. There are a revision of some of the things that you heard this morning already. In order to get any message across to people, it, it needs to be logical, okay? That's where the logos comes in. And of course, science is particularly adept at the logos part of it. Um, it need to, you need to have evidence. 
by and large, okay? But there are two other very important elements. One is pathos, and that is the emotional appeal. So again, Alan talked about that before. And it doesn't have to be a wildly emotional appeal. You don't have to get people to, to fall in love. You don't have to get people to feel terror or anything like that. One of the things you can do is just not annoy them, okay? <laughs> many, many times when we write, we annoy people, right? We annoy them with bad punctuation. We annoy them with repetition. We annoy them with being dull or whatever. Okay, if you can eliminate the annoyance, your message has a much better get chance to get across. So pathos is very important, okay? Don't just go with the logic or the logos. And then the final thing, which is equally important, I think, is ethos. In fact, Aristotle says it's the most important. And ethos is your character, okay? You have to, in some way, get the person to trust you. Uh, we talked again this morning already about how scientists are supposed to take themselves out of their scientific writing. And to some extent, yes, you're not supposed to add in all the details about what time you went to the lab and all that sort of stuff. On the other hand, your, your personality is being judged by the way you're writing, okay? And people will decide. If you read one paragraph or two paragraphs of an article in any journal, you will already decide whether you're trusting that person or not who's, who's speaking. And so partly it's your responsibility to make yourself as good a scientist as possible and also as good a communicator as possible. But the way you come off your ethos has a huge effect. And I think it's liberating for people to realize that it's not just all in the evidence. It's not just all in the logos. As important as that is, you have to, to present to people a good ethos in order to get across your message, whether you're on television or anywhere else. And you have to think about the emotions of the readers, okay, whether positive or negative. Um, next thing you need is a systematic organization. Uh, I've been, for 30 years I've been teaching writing, and I think there are only 10 ways to organize. Uh, there aren't 25, there aren't 50, there are only 10. One is cause and effect, one is comparison contrast, that sort of thing, okay? One is telling a story. And obviously telling a story is a huge part of getting a message across to the general public. People respond well to stories. Um, everybody who's ever written a novel, go, you know, going back to Charles Dickens and beyond, they have a point that they want to get across. They're not just trying to tell a story. And they've chosen the story as a way of getting their, their, their uh, point across. So think about that option. But at the same time, in your scientific writing, and in fact in any writing, you need to know the other methods of organiza organization. Uh, assertion with reasons, assertion, assertion with uh, uh, evidence, um, definition, things like that. Anyway, the whole list is only 10 things, and you want to make that part of your sense of an arsenal when you go to work as, as a writer, of your intuitions. Next thing you need is a, a, an idea of how to start, an idea how to stop, <laughs> and an idea of, of how to paragraph, or just to, to divide up your ideas into parts. Uh, paragraphing is, it might seem like just a, a convention, but I think it has a lot to do with the way our minds work. You know, we can absorb so much information and then we need a little break, and then we can absorb some more information that's related but not the same, okay? So that's another intuition that you want to, to develop. Um, then you want to have, remember your readership, you want to think about how to revise. You need to go back after you've finished writing and reread it from the reader's point of view and see if you can, you know, tighten it up or make things clear, or be more specific, or give an example, add a story, whatever, whatever you can do. If you're reading it from the reader's point of view, obviously there's gonna be a world of difference if you revise and spend, spend some time. And one of the tricks of the trade is to wait between when you write your first draft and to revise. Because when you've just written it, you're in love with it, right? We love, we love nothing better than what we <laughs> write ourselves, even if it's terrible. Um, we don't want anybody to see it, but we still love it, okay? We cherish it. So you need to get away from it for a few days, if possible, before you can revise it. And, when, and then when you do get away, then you can look at it from another point of view. Uh, after that, grammar is important. Uh, I will talk about that a little bit tomorrow and get you involved in it and show you some really fun ways to make your grammar better than it is. Um, second to last thing you need to know, know, and you're good at this generally, is where to get your research, okay? That's something, if you're teaching students, you have to spend a lot of time on. Uh, as, as an experienced scientist, you're probably pretty good at, at where to get your research, but you're still probably not that good at selecting which research or which details, you know, which results of the research you're supposed to um, pay most attention to. And then finally, something that I think very pe few people outside the writing community or the teaching writing community think about is your own writing process. Everybody 
goes about writing in their own way. If I tell you exactly what you should do first, what you should do second, what you, what you should do third, it won't work. Or it might work for two of you out of 40, okay? Um, it's like learning. Some people learn best visually, as we said this morning, some best auditorially, some best kinesthetically, which is a fancy word for improv, <laughs> okay? Learning through your body. Um, I think the best teaching uses all three modes, and that's one of the reasons I'm really enthusiastic about the combination that we use here in this Center for Communicating Science. Um, but getting all those things working together is, is what you want, want to look for. And similarly with, with um, writing process, everybody has their own way of doing it, and most people have some functionality in that way and some dysfunctionality <laughs> in that way. So one of the things we'll try to do in these couple of days is have you see each other's way of writing and, and you will learn some good things from others, and you will also learn some things from yourself that maybe you'd like to ditch and that, that are actually wasting your time. Okay, now we'll get to the homework. Uh, I would like you to spend about 20 minutes <coughs> writing, and there, we have a little technical complication here. Some of you have laptops. If you have lap laptops, you can email me what you've written. Uh, and I guess I just have to spell it out because we don't have a board here, but E.R. Hammond. E-R-H-A-M-M-O-N-D, at, and Stony Brook has the worst email system in the world in terms of complication. It is notes, N-O-T-E-S, dot, C-C, dot, S-U-N-Y-S-B, dot, <laughs> E-D-U, <laughs> finally. We'll get some, okay. Uh, only bad thing about Stony Brook University is its email address. Um, okay, so if you don't, then you can handwrite it and put it on the table where you've gotten your registration. And you can do that all afternoon if you need to, but I would really like to have them as soon as we go to lunch because I want to read them this afternoon and get ready for tomorrow's workshops, okay? I will tell you that right now. I threw, you off, I threw you off at the email address. I'm sorry. Uh, two questions I want you to answer in about four or five sentences each. The first question is, why do you think your broad field should be communicated to the public? So your broad field might be bioengineering, it might be astrophysics, it might be chemistry. And I really want you to think in terms of the whole breadth of the, of the field, not just the part that you're in. Why do you think it's important that the, that the public understands your, your field? Okay, and then the second thing that I want you to write, also four or five sentences, is why the public should know about the particular research that you do. Again, four or five sentences. Part of my motive here is repetition, in that you're going to do this, and I almost predicted that you're not going to do it all that well. And then the next time we do it, you're going to do it so much better. And I think the same thing will be true for improv and everything else. The first time you do it, it's kind of awkward. You're not quite ready. You haven't been doing this for, very, for a while. But with some repetition, you'll get much better at it. So again, the two questions are why my broad field should be communicated to the public, four or five sentences. And the second one, why my specific research should be communicated to the press. Yes. OK, I'll tell you, I, my other assignment that I was going to give you is justify your salary. OK? I like that. And I really like that. I really like that question. However, I wouldn't. I wouldn't force you to get, show that to other people. <laughs> and I want to be able to show it to other people so we can't use that one. We'll, oh. we'll have a couple of assignments in the next two That's right. I'll give you a new, new assignment tomorrow. Is there a Wi-Fi network? That there is. Yes. I think AMX is open. If you have trouble with it, uh, let me know and we'll get you guest passwords to the other networks. You try AMX. Yeah, I tried that out in the hallway and it worked, actually. Uh, so any, any questions about that? We'll go into much more detail tomorrow and, and Friday.